December the 31st, 1899. The last day of the century. So much to look forward to. So much to look back on. Well, that's true of most lives, isn't it? Moments of happiness, moments of sadness, ups and downs, triumph and disaster. And it's certainly true of mine. And it's all in here. See these books? My diaries, stretching way back to the time I was a ten-year-old, to the time I was a schoolgirl. And that's me, Maggie Johnson, at Stanton Elementary School, a long time ago. when the inspector comes. Continue, class. Nine threes of twenty-seven, ten threes of thirty. Well, yes, tables were boring, but they had to be done. Or that's what our teachers would tell us. As well as arithmetic, the other big thing was reading and writing. We were forever copying out sentences and being tested on our spellings. Oh, this is very untidy, Jenny. Begin again. Start with a nice clean slate. I want everyone to put their pens down now, all their pencils. We also had vocal gymnastics. Around the rugged rock, the ragged rascal ran. Around the rugged rock, The rock is rugged and the man is ragged. The rocks are rugged and the man is ragged. One, two, three. And four, we had physical gymnastics. Five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Dumbbell exercise. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, We had some of that every day. Six, the country seven, needs fit, healthy eight, people, said the government. One, fit people to work two, in the factories. Three, four. Writing was what I liked best, especially when I was old enough to use pen and ink. I would often stay behind to finish when all the other children had gone. You know, Maggie, you write really well. I do. Ah, you have a good hand. Thank you, Mum. And not just that, you notice things. Ever thought of keeping a diary? A diary? Yes, you know, an everyday account. Things you notice, things you think about. Oh, I don't know, Mum. I couldn't do that. Why not? Because I'm ordinary. Nothing to write about. Oh, rubbish. Nobody's ordinary. And you're just as good as anybody else. Never forget that, Maggie Johnson. Here, you can use this old notebook. And get started tonight, do you hear? So I did get started. October the 15th. 1877. This is the beginning of Maggie Johnson's diary. Yes, I suppose I was quite a bright little girl. But that can be a problem. There was this girl called Susan Bailey, a couple of years older than me, and it didn't do to get on the wrong side of her. A bit of a leader was Susan, and a bit of a temper as well. And the trouble was, she wasn't one for her books. Let's have a look then, Susan. Oh dear. Mess. 
mess. Crossing's out. And you've blotted your copybook. It's not good, is it, Susan? Are you sure you're trying your hardest? Yes, Mum. Well, there are younger girls here that could put you to shame. Maggie? Yes, Mum? Bring your copybook here. Oh, Mum? No. Bring your copybook. Now, short to Susan. There. Do you see how it should be done? Oh, I see what should be done. And you won't forget? No. I won't forget. And she never did forget. From that moment on, she had it in for me. January the 18th. Susan Bailey picked a quarrel with me in the playground. So, the copybook girl. Think you're so clever, don't you? No, I don't. Smarming up to Miss Bates, teacher's pet. That's not fair. Know what? I don't think I like you, Maggie Johnson. And that was just the start of it. Hello, Maggie. Just thought we'd borrow your hoop for a bit. Well, you don't mind, do you? No, she doesn't mind. Teacher's pet, teacher's pet. January the 20th. Susan was really nasty to me again. Oh, sorry. Oh, dear. Look what we've done. We've knocked Maggie over. Now that is interesting. I do believe my mother used to wear those shoes when she was a girl. Where'd you buy your shoes? At the poor house. <laughs> <laughs> Not a nice girl, that Susan. But fortunately for me, she left that Christmas to go into service. I was very pleased, because it meant I could get on with my life. Ah, let's see. February the 2nd. Miss Bates gave us a lecture about tomorrow's inspection. Very worried she was. They say she may lose her job if we do badly. Now, I don't need to tell you how important this is. Why is this important, ma'am? Because we have to be tested. Why do we have to be tested? Because the government says so. Now, when Mr Woodhead asks you a question, I want you to answer with nice, loud, clear voices. When the inspector arrived, we were shaking in our boots. So was Miss Bates. Miss Bates. Good morning, Mr. Woodhead. Children, this is the inspector. Good morning, Mr. Woodhead. Inspection commenced five minutes past ten. You, seven sixes. Forty-two. Nine fives. Forty-five. Eight sevens. Um, fifty-three. Very poor girl. Very poor. Fair, average, poor, average, appalling. The Queen rules the empire. Spell empire. E M P I R E. Queen. Q U E E N. Nation. N A S. Oh, no, 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 no. What is the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What is the sixth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Good. The inspection seemed to go on forever. 
and by the time it was finished, Miss Bates was looking quite ill. The three R's, Miss Bates. Reading, writing, arithmetic. Pound it into them. Yes, but what about the other things? You know, art, music, beauty. That's all very well for girls, Miss Bates. But for the boys, the three R's. Foundation of the Empire. I don't know. Children, I have some very serious news for you. The inspector has given the school a pass. And he's asked me to give you a half-day holiday. Yes, we had our good times at school. Especially when I didn't have to bother with that Susan. That's the last I'll see of her, I thought. <laughs> oh dear, how wrong can you be? But that's a different story. That will have to wait till next time. Now, where were we? Oh yes, 1880. I'd had my last year at school and done well. Miss Bates thought I should try for a teacher, but Mother couldn't afford to feed me anymore, so off I had to go to work, and I applied for a position as a kitchen maid. September the 9th. I walked to Pockley Manor today to be interviewed by Mrs Willoughby. It's a very grand house, and my heart was knocking as I walked up the drive. I was that scared. Please, ma'am. Maggie Johnson, she's come about the housemaid post. Well, Maggie Johnson, your teacher has given you a good reference. I wonder if it is to be trusted. Are you clean? I hope so, ma'am. Do you know your catechism and the Lord's Prayer? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. I really want a job, ma'am. I'll do as best I can. I promise I will. We shall see. Go to the kitchen. Mrs Higgins will explain your duties. Does this mean I've got the job? It would appear so. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Your day starts at half past five. That's what time I want you down here, laying the fire. Half past five. Any objections? Half past five on the dot. After that, get the dining room ready for breakfast. And at quarter past seven, it's servants' prayers. Eight o'clock, carry the hot water up to the bedrooms and take the slops out. Nine o'clock, black the stove. Ten o'clock, scrub the floors. Eleven o'clock, make the beds. I knew it was going to be hard work, but I couldn't help feeling downhearted. And then I had a worse shock. Oh, Susan, can you come here a minute? And meet the new housemaid, Maggie. We've met. We were at school together. Oh, good. Then you have a friend already. You could say that.
My bed was up in the attic. I shared a room with the other maids. As junior maid, I was the first one who had to get up, and that first night I was terrified of oversleeping. I just lay awake, listening for the grandfather clock. Five o'clock, Maggie. Time to get up. And once I was up, it was work, work, work. Your day started half past five, lay in the fire. I never seemed to stop. Eight o'clock, carry the hot water up to the bedrooms and take the slops out. Nine o'clock, black the stove. Ten o'clock, scrub the floors. Most of the others are kind to me. But Susan, as I might have guessed, is no help at all. of me. Susan, can't we be friends? What do you think? Dear Mother, I know you'll be worrying about me, so I'm just writing to say that I enjoy the work and everyone is very friendly. I trust this finds you as it finds me, well and in good spirits. Your loving daughter, Maggie. Well, Maggie, first week over and done with. How do you feel? Tired. I'm so tired. Of course you're tired. So are all the workers. It's not right. No, it's not, is it? So why does it have to be like this? Because it just does. Come on now, let's have a look at that newspaper. Yes, quite good. Can't have a crumpled newspaper. And to put mistress in a good mood, a little scent to make the news smell sweeter. Go on, off you go with it. Is that you, Maggie? Come here. You can put the paper on the side. Jane is in, so you must help lace me in. Now then. I want you to pull with all your might. I'm getting to the stage where I need all the help I can get from a corset. By the way, we're having company this evening, so you must wait on instead of Jane. Very well, ma'am. Oh, dear. I really don't know. What do you think? It looks very well on you, ma'am. So many decisions. So many decisions and Jane ill. It's very hard being Lady of the House, Maggie. I'm sure it is. By the way, have you seen my garnet brooch? No, ma'am. Strange. It seems to have gone missing. Well, run along. By the evening, I'd forgotten all about her ladyship's brooch. I was that busy getting the dinner ready. We all were. Come on, everyone. They've almost finished the soup. Hurry up with that turbot. Susan, how are the pheasants? Almost done. And who's looking after the beef? Check it, John. Check it. Oh, oh Lord, bless us. How is a woman to run a kitchen with you lot? I got through the meal all right, but when it came to serving the coffee, Susan was up to her usual mean, spiteful tricks and made me spill it all over myself.
Well, Maggie, that was a bit of a mess. Ignore her, love. Oh, but it was so embarrassing in there. <laughs> These things happen. Oh, I'll catch him. Likes a bit of music after dinner, Mrs. Willoughby does. But look at the food they've left. Hardly eaten anything. Aye. Uh, that's their way. Pick and choose. The rich man in his castle. When I think what my mother would give for this, just for a mouthful, Dear Missa, kill me a love. September the 25th. It's been a week now since the dinner party and something else has gone missing. Mrs Higgins asked us about it in the morning. She seemed very worried. I'm afraid I have some unfortunate news. Mistress has lost another bit of jewellery, an emerald ring. Have you seen it, Maggie? No, Mrs Higgins. John? Jane? No, ma'am. What about you, Susan? Haven't seen a thing. Are you sure? Oh, well. Keep your eyes peeled, everyone. Get back to work. It sounds as though there's a thief in the house, and I know who I suspect, but it's not for me to say so. I can't ignore it, Higgins. It's happening too often to be a coincidence. It's a very bad business, ma'am. What do you suggest? Well, there's always the florin in the carpet. Oh, oldest trick in the book, ma'am. You hide a florin away. If the maid doesn't find it, she isn't sweeping the carpet properly. If she does find it, she either returns it to you, and you know she's honest. And if she doesn't return it, you know. Exactly, ma'am. What you got there, Maggie? It's a coin. I found it under the carpet. I must give it to Mistress. Tell you what, I'm just going to see her now. I'll give it to her. Should have known better, shouldn't I? September 29th. Worst day of my life. Summoned to see Mrs Willoughby. When I got there, Mrs Higgins was with her. And so was Susan. Maggie, you of all people. Mum? I'm very disappointed in you. I'm sorry. I don't understand. I have been talking to Susan. She says you found a florin coin underneath the carpet. Well, so I did, Mum. How can you be so bold? I found the coin and gave it to Susan to give to you. Susan, did Maggie give you the coin? No, ma'am. But I did! Susan, I'll ask you once again. Did Maggie give you the coin? No, ma'am. I saw her put it in her pocket. What? It's not true! I'm sorry to tell you all this, ma'am. She was my friend till this happened, but I thought it was my duty. You did quite right. You may go. So, Maggie Johnson, what have you to say for yourself? I... I... Nothing to say. Very well. You will leave this house immediately. You will receive no letter of commendation from me or personal character. This is a very sad day for all of us. A very sad day. Oh, 
that dreadful business at the manor. Just dreadful. Well, after that, I tried to get work in the area, but there was nothing doing, not without a reference. So eventually, I took the bit between my teeth. June 20th, 1884. Today, I decided to go down to London and seek my fortune. I've spent so long looking for work and nothing has come of it. I went on a train for the first time. The ticket used up most of my savings, but people say it's easy to get a job in London, so that shouldn't matter. Well, people were wrong. Excuse me, sir, do you have a vacancy? I'm sorry, afraid not. Do you have any work? Sorry, no. No references? Sorry. Pardon my saying, but you look a bit down. Want to tell me about it? I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Oh, come on. I just can't get a job anywhere. It's impossible without references. And I've hardly any money and I don't know a soul. Oh, hey, hey. <laughs> come on, let's try and sort this out. Well, you look strong enough. Can you work long hours? Yes. Because the place I'm thinking of smells to high heaven and they work you into the ground. It ain't paradise. I don't want paradise, I want a job. Well, in that case, you come along with me. <laughs> no references needed at this place. So off I went to work at Bryant and May. And that's what I did for five years, packing up boxes of matches. Here we are. There were machines to do some of the work and girls to do most of it. We didn't break down as often as machines. Looks quite pleasant in that picture, doesn't it? But then photographs don't always tell the whole story. It was a hard life. For a start, we had to stand all day, no sitting down allowed. Twelve-hour days, and all for a sight less than a pound a week. And she was right about the smell. I was sick twice on my first day. It was the phosphorus. Evil stuff they used to make the match head strike. If you weren't careful, the phosphorus would get in your teeth and gums, and then it would rot your jaws away. Fozzy jaw, they called it. One girl died of it in my first year. Poor Mabel. And last off, and in a strange way, this got to me more than anything. No talking or laughing aloud. You, Miller, I heard you. You know the rules? Threaten's fine. The one time we were allowed to talk was the lunch break. Bad luck, Bessie. Yeah, proper swine, that foreman. Well, I'm not going to let the likes of him get me down. Sunday tomorrow, I'm going to get my picture taken. That must cost a lot. No, it don't. Sixpence a go. Here, you want to come along? A photographer? Mm-hmm. Never seen a photographer. <laughs> A correct portrait, framed and glazed for sixpence. Here we are then. Uh, if you, madam, would care to sit there, and you, miss, can take the other seat. Will that do you? Yes, that'll be fine. <clears throat> ah, yes. Well, um, 
this way. Better get on with work. Okay. Ah, yes. Now, this is a face to marvel at. Get on with it. Right, just hold it there then. Let's have a look. To me, it was all amazing. Ah, yes. That's looking good. That's looking good. But it was the photographs that really caught my attention. London as I'd never seen it before. And all brought to life by Mr. Carter and his camera. Just hold it still. Hold it still. There were some children that I couldn't take my eyes off. Barefoot they were. And that's no fun, I can tell you. And a bear, I ask you. A bear in a London street. What an amazing sight. There you are, all done. <laughs> They're really good, these. Oh, well, you've got good taste. <laughs> You're making your fortune, then? Oh, hardly. <laughs> but in a few months' time, business will be booming. And when business is booming, I might just need an assistant. <laughs> so when do I collect the photograph? Oh, it'll yeah, come back next week. And uh, maybe I can um, take your photograph next, miss. Maybe. Cheerio. <laughs> Well, well, well. I think you made a bit of a conquest there. <laughs> ah, but this was not so good. July 26th. Had a surprise at work. A nasty surprise. Here, Miller. Got a new girl starting, so she can work at your table. Show her how it's done. Hello, I'm Bessie. Susan. I'm Martha. Hello. Hello, Maggie. Susan Bailey. Of course it's me. Don't you remember, Maggie? Aye, I remember. You two know each other. You could say that. Well, this is what you've got to do. It's not hard. You'll pick it up easy. Now you just have to take the match. I couldn't believe it. But then I remembered I'd heard something about Susan finally being caught stealing at the manor. So she must have come to the big city like I did, like thousands of girls were doing, to find the sort of work where they didn't need references. Come on, shove up. Give that girl some room. It's really kind of you to be so welcoming. Nice to have a new face. Would you like some of my cheese? Oh, don't mind if I do. So what brings you south, Susan? Felt like a change. Got the sack. I chose to leave. Come on, give her a chance, Maggie. That's not like you. I don't know. Maybe I was being unfair. But I couldn't bring myself to forget the past. The awful trouble at the manor. However, that afternoon, things happened that made my quarrel with Susan seem very unimportant. Bessie had been very quiet the whole day, and all of a sudden she just collapsed. What's going on here? Get back to your work. And you, Bessie Miller, get off the floor. How can she? Can't you see she's fainted? Oh, well. All right, then. But I want this table working in two minutes. What's the matter, Bessie? It's my gums. They're that sore. And the teeth, too. The pain's terrible. Is it fuzzy jaw? It is, isn't it? You need that looking to. Of course I do! How can the likes of me afford the dentist? Maggie, I keep thinking of poor Mabel. It's not right. As God's my witness, it's not right. No, it's not. But what can the likes of us do? We get together, that's what. What do you mean? We've got to change things. All of us in it together. On our own, it's no good. Look, on our own, they'll break us. Just like that. But if we stick together, Different story, see? So that's the secret. Stick together. 
Know what, Maggie Johnson? You're a troublemaker, you are. I think Mr. Bryant needs to be told about you. Oh, Maggie, we're just a bunch of women. Well, someone's got to do something about it. And praise the Lord, somebody did do something about it. Mrs. Annie Besant. She'd heard about the conditions and she wrote an article in a newspaper called The Link. Appalling conditions for match girls, the horrors of phosphorus, white slavery in London. As you can imagine, that really put the cat amongst the pigeons. It was the talk of the town and Mr Bryant was furious. So furious that he took certain steps. You, Maggie Johnson, you can get your things and go. Mr Bryant knows all about her. Knows what? That she sent that pack of lies to the present woman. I never told her nothing. So you may say. But there again, we have sources of information that say different. And what might those sources be? That I am not at liberty to reveal. I wonder if I can guess. Who could it be, Susan? Maggie's the best worker you've got, Mr Watkins. Is that right? Well, that's not how Mr Bryant sees it. Regular troublemaker. <laughs> I told him. It's not fair. And he wants all the ringleaders out. You're finished, Maggie Johnson. Do you hear me? You're finished. Finished, am I, Mr Watkins? Well, that's as may be. I may be finished, but the others here are only just beginning. Remember the matches, girls. Never forget the matches. Yes! yes! Oh, I enjoyed that moment. I might have been sacked, but when I heard them banging, I knew I'd started something. Of course, the first thing I had to do now was find some other work. Not easy, but I had an idea of where to go. Come about the job. So there I was, sacked from the factory, out on my ear again. Good thing for me I had my knight in shining armour. Yes, young Mr Carter, the photographer. June 17th, start of a new career. My first full day as a photographer's assistant. Right, it's really very simple, Miss Johnson. You focus the camera here, then it's lens cap off, count for three seconds, two, three, lens cap back on, then you whip the plate out the back and into the dark room. Bob's your uncle, got it? I think so. You'll pick it up soon enough, I should think. You'll have to anyway, because uh, summer's the busy time and I need you to look after the portrait side while I get on with the real photography. What do you mean? Oh, didn't you know? Oh, come and have a look at these. This is what I've been doing recently. I call it people at work. There you are, I see. Chimney sweep. Look at that one. <laughs> with the tools of his trade. Oh, I like him. Yes, and a very fine top hat. Oh, there's a nanny. Taking the young master out on a little trip in the pram. Oh yes, the postman. Out in the rounds on their, on their bicycles. Uh, baskets for parcels. And look at that man with the beard. Isn't he wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> ah, now, this is one of my favourites. The window cleaners. Just look at them. One, two, three, four. Far too many to count. Now, that took a lot of setting up, I can tell you. Yes, I'm sure it did. Now, here's another one. Women hard at work. You might recognise this photo. Bryant and May. 
I was in there last year. Right, I'd better be off and uh, take some more masterpieces. I'll leave you to look after the shop, OK? All right. Cheerio, see you later. Bryant and May. Well, well. Suddenly, I was back on the factory floor. And while I was lost in my thoughts, someone came into the shop. My first customer. And as it turned out, a very important one. Good morning, madam. Good morning. I'm looking for Maggie Johnson. That's me, but... I was told I'd find you here. Let me introduce myself. My name's Annie Besant. Mrs Besant? That's right. Mrs Besant who wrote the article. You're the one who's telling people what goes on at Bryant and May. Trying to, at any rate. And I've heard quite a lot about you. On our own, it's no good. But together, we can't be broken. Well, someone had to stand up. Exactly. And I've come to ask if you can help me some more. Help? Of course I will. That is, I've only just started here. But perhaps Mr Carter wouldn't mind if I helped you out of hours. We'll soon find out, I fancy. Ah, Maggie, I forgot that... Mr Carter, this is Mrs Besant. You remember that article in the link? Well, she wrote it. Oh, really? Well, congratulations. <laughs> Mrs Besant wanted to know if I could help her. Oh, yes, yes, of course, yes. Here, maybe I could uh, take some photographs. Wonderful. And a week later, Mrs Besson wrote a second article. The revolt of the matchmakers, why not prosecute Brian and May, helping the girls on strike, that really got things going. And shortly afterwards, I had another visitor. Surprise! Oh, Besson! Hello, Hello. Hello. <laughs> Why aren't you at work? Ah, oh, thereby hangs the tail. <laughs> It was that article what done it. It got old Bryant really rattled. He knew we was excited about it. I don't know how, but he did. Must have got his spies on the shop floor. Anyhow, the next day, Watkins comes marching up to us, waving this little bit of paper. Right, you lot. You can take an early dinner break, cos I need to have a word with you. Someone's been spreading more tittle-tattle about the factory. Nosy Parker Besson's been writing some more about poison. Good for her. So here's a little problem that's got to be solved. And here's how we're going to solve it. Sign this. All of you. I'll be back after dinner to collect it. We, the undersigned, disagree with articles by Mrs Besson. What? And wish the public to know that we are well treated and content at Bryant and Man. Well treated and content? But Bessie! What was it Maggie said? If we stick together, they can't break us. You and Ethel. What about you, Daisy? And you're with us, Susan, ain't you? Er, uh, yes. Good for you. So, anyone want to sign? That's that, then. Here we go, girls! Yeah! It was the same on all the other tables. Not a single person signed. <laughs> so when Watkins comes back an hour later, he nearly has a fit. What's the meaning of this, then? It means, Mr Watkins, that we cannot tell a lie. I'd love to have seen his face. It's a picture, Maggie. Bang about, I haven't finished yet. Watkins comes back from a meeting with the boss and he tells me I'm fired because I'm the ringleader. But glory be, when I walk out of that building, listen to this, so do all the others. What? All 1,400 of them. <gasps> Hold on a minute, women don't go on strike. Oh, don't they? Well, we have and we've made history. Oh, Maggie, I'm so excited, I've even forgotten the pain in my teeth. What happens next? We're going to form a strike committee and we need you. Will you come, Maggie? Of course I will. July 10th. First meeting of the strike committee. There were six of us in all and I was sorry to find that Susan Bailey was there. 
The others say she's to be trusted, but I'm not so sure. Right. The first thing we need to do is start a strike fund. That way no one's going to starve. I'll talk to my friends in the press, and then we must march to Westminster to talk to the MPs. When is that planned for? Two days' time. But keep that a secret. We don't want anyone sabotaging it in advance. Mm. Right, that's that. And now I hope you'll all join me for a cup of tea. If you don't mind, Mrs Besant, I must be going. That's all right, Susan. Good night. Why is she in such a hurry? I wonder. July 12th. All is going well. The money is pouring in from the public and more people are coming onto our side. Bryant and May are doing their best to spoil our plans, which they still seem to know all about. Somehow they are spying on us. But how? Ah well, we are determined to beat them, spies and all. July 14th. Had another meeting of the strike committee. The motion of this meeting is that we approve the following demands for tomorrow's meeting with the management. One, a fair and decent wage. Two, better dental treatment for all workers. Three, foremen to be answerable for all their actions. And four, the workers have the right to form their own union. All those in favour? Motion carried. <laughs> It was then that I went to get some more paper from a bag. What I didn't realise was that Susan had brought the same sort of bag as mine, and by mistake, I picked up hers. That's funny. Bryant and May. They never wrote to me. That's mine. It's private, it's private, but let me have it. Dear Miss Bailey, thank you for your information. It has been most helpful. You will be paid 12 shillings and sixpence. Yours, William Bryant. I can explain. It's not what you think. It's not. You'd better go, Susan. Susan Bailey. She was bad through and through. Always had been, always would be. For the meeting with the management, it was just Bessie and Mrs Besant. But Bessie had promised to come straight back to the studio and tell me what happened. Come on, come on. We must have news soon. we we'll watched Kettle, Maggie. I know, I know. Wonderful. We won! We won! We won! We got it all, Maggie. We got our wages, we got our trade unions, and we got our free dentists. So now you get your teeth seen to. I know! No fussy jaw, Maggie. I'm going to live. August the 8th. What a year it's been. And today put the icing on the cake. Jim had bought a new tandem bicycle, and he took me out for a picnic. I heard from Bessie this morning. Oh, yeah. Foreman Watkins got the push yesterday. Oh, yes. And they've just had the first meeting of the Union of Women Matchmakers. Have they indeed? Oh, well, actually, that's, uh, that's given me an idea, you know. Um, this business of making matches, well, I was, I was, I was wondering, Mags. Um, yes? Well, I, I, was, I was wondering if perhaps uh, you and I could make a match. Oh, Jim. Oh, no, we couldn't possibly do that. On the other hand, maybe we could form a union. It's going to be all right. 
everything's gonna be all right. it would get to. Oh yes, 1888, the matchmaker's strike and the great day of victory. I'll never forget that. And three months later came another wonderful day. October the 10th. I married my dear Jim today and I do believe I got the best man in the world. Martha and Bessie were the bridesmaids. Susan Bailey I did not ask to the wedding. Happy days. And what's more, business boom, just as Jim said it would. And he was off all over London snapping away while I touched up the photos in the studio and photographed the customers. Parasol? I used to get a lot of female clients. They found it all a bit embarrassing. And if it came to tidying their hair or dress or whatever, they'd rather it was a woman doing it for them. Going to the Jubilee, Mrs. Carter? Oh, yes, I'll be there. Big day for the Queen. Right. Just keep nice and still for me. 200, 300. All done. Will Mr. Carter be going to the Jubilee as well? Certainly will. Can't keep him away from a good subject. Yes, Jim loves his work, and I have to say, he gets some beauties. Have a look at these, Mrs. Williams. Ah. The seaside. Always a winner, according to Jim. People really let the hair down there, and they even show their legs off. The hardy ones go swimming. Horse-drawn bathing carriages for the ladies. And the not so hardy ones stay on dry land. And some people just enjoy themselves. <laughs> I think Jim got a bit carried away with this one. What else? Oh, yes, he's a lovely old couple. That's how I think Jim and me will be in our old age. And as the years went by, there were one or two other developments. First there was Maud, and then there was little Alice. One, two, three. Late. Go back to 44. Oh dear. Alice is always late for everything. She'll be late for the Jubilee. No, I won't. What's a Jubilee? The Jubilee? That's, that's the Diamond Jubilee of your Queen. There she is over there, look. Her Majesty Queen Victoria. And on the day of her Diamond Jubilee, she will have been reigning for 60 glorious years. What a day that was. The whole country cheering its head off, and London was chock-a-block with people. Celebration in London. The Queen's procession. And a month later, Jim had another surprise for me. September the 22nd. Amazing day. Jim took me down to the Empire to see the animated photographs. <laughs> Jubilee. Which one's the Queen? She'll be along in a minute. She had a parasol. It was a hot day, remember? Oh, yes. There she is. Next up, London street scenes, everyone. Few 
future films will last a whole ten minutes. But to me, even more amazing than the moving pictures was a photograph that Jim had taken. It was of a poor beggar woman down on a lock. And as I looked at it, the face seemed to haunt me. Jim, come here a minute. Hmm? Where did you take this photograph? Oh, not far from here. She's a regular poor thing. Strange. I could swear I know that face. Still. Come on, children, get ready. We're going for a walk. And as we walked along to the park, there she was. I slowed down as I neared her, and as she raised her head, she caught my eye. And then I knew. Well, well, well. Susan? Here's a turn up for the books and no mistake. Oh, Susan. Those your two? Yes. Got your eyes, she has. That takes me back. Stanton Elementary School. It's not too late, Susan. The Salvation no, Army... No, thanks, Maggie. You deserve your life. I deserve mine. Well, at least let me give you some money, something to tide you over. This way. Carry her through to the front room. Jim, get a doctor. Oh, very grand. But tell him not to bother. Too late for that. You're going to be all right. And get a priest too. So much to look forward to, so much to look back on. Strange to think that someone could be sitting here in a hundred years time, keeping a diary just like me. Will life have changed? Probably. But I don't think people will have changed. People are people. Now let me see. What happened today? 